I did give a talk last year, and uh, so anybody who can remember that far back, you may have heard this. I'm trying not to go into too much detail on the previous years, and also I am not showing the picture of the Paul Frank ladies and everybody else. <laughs> My experience last year was that everybody else had the same slide. <laughs> I'm also not explaining a lot of the background information on the on the restoration work because um, I'm the last person in this segment, and uh, that's been covered pretty well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm really just talking about the bird monitoring work, um, and I realized what, although I, when I <laughs> sent in my abstract, I was really focusing on the marsh bird monitoring. For the first, or actually technically it was the second phase of this restoration project, um, Air Bird Observatory, or Audubon, which I was previously, um, monitored only the marsh breeding birds. So these are rare secretive birds, I'll go into it in a minute. Um, but actually, this third phase now, we are also monitoring waterfowl and water birds, which is a more, slightly more larger umbrella term for um, water dependent birds, uh, more than just ducks and geese. So, actually, I just I changed my title very slightly here and I said, plus some initial information on the water <laughs> bird monitoring. <laughs> so, I'm throwing that in at the end, even though I forgot to include it in the abstract. Um, I don't actually have a lot of results, but I wanted to just tell you a little bit about it, um, what we're doing on that. So, um, this is um, primarily our question has been how are marsh breeding birds responding to the ongoing marsh restoration efforts? So you've heard tons about the uh, about all the uh, the uh, restoration efforts. So I'm not going into that at all. <laughs> Um, but marsh breeding birds are an interesting group uh, because they're really hard to, to detect. You don't see them primarily, and they hide in the, the, the emergent marsh grasses or uh, uh, reeds and, and cattails and stuff, so you don't see them um, very often. <coughs> you can hear them if you're out at night in the middle of a marsh, you know, but it's like how many people go out in the middle of the night to a marsh? So it really takes some very specific um, methodology to get to whether they're here or not. But the other important thing to know about them is they're all in decline and they've all, um, it's there because wetlands overall have been diminished drastically throughout the North American content, continent, um, there's way fewer of these birds than there should be or historically have been, and there's way fewer than. Um, uh, than we would like them to be, and they are very easily affected by habitat quality and degraded habitat quality, which does occur when places get taken over by single species of invasive. So, um, this is what we've been doing. Fortunately, we did, I actually had a different project way back in 2011, which was before, right the year before the first helicopter spray event in 2012, which was really the biggest. Um, single reduction in the Phragmites coverage of the wetlands. So we actually have some before um, numbers from um, marsh birds. Um, and then so the last three years now, 17, 18, 19, um, we are, um, have been doing the, um, the standardized protocol that's been developed um, so that people are using the same methodology across lots of sites in North America. And it is, um, it's basically, it's a survey, I should have, I should have brought out, I should have brought the, the call. The calls these birds make are really bizarre sounding. Um, they're very distinctive, but they are um, just weird noises that these birds make. And they're kind of squawky, and one of them sounds like a little tin horn is blowing, and one, you know, they have these funny sounds they make. Um, but what you do during this standardized North American marsh bird monitoring protocol is you have a period of listening, and then you do playbacks of the different species calls in a sequence that with silence in between. So first you 
broadcast the call of the Pikeville Green, um, and then you wait 30 seconds, and then you broadcast the call of the next one. So there's this whole protocol that's about 15, and then you end up with additional silence at the very end. And what you're doing is trying to elicit responses, because these birds don't necessarily call spontaneously. So you're out there in the morning, you're listening for that, but then by, by, pro by providing a stimulus of the call of the conspecific, which makes it sound like there's an intruder in their territory, that can make them call back. And the funny thing is, actually, they often call back to the other species, not just their own. So um, when you do get them calling, um, responding to your playback, um, you can get them you know, responding to multiple species of that. But it is a really uh, an effective method. And so we have a whole series of points that we go out and visit. The, initially in 2011, we have about 28 points, and hard to see them, but in the middle of some of these dots, <laughs> there's that red, smallest red circle. Then there was additional points. We uh, used the same set plus some in 17. We added a couple more points in 2018. This year, we added quite a lot, and um, this is my new overlay, primarily because we wanted to get a whole bunch of points out here at Gulf Point. There was a whole series of smaller, um, wetlands out there with a lot of phragmites and the, the helicopter did hit them this year so we actually wanted to see what was out there um, they are interrupted by trees so it's not large contiguous areas of, of marsh um, but um, we wanted we put in we added a bunch more points there and actually we added a couple more in here because the way Holly's team has been pushing back the frontier of, <laughs> of the Phragmites, you can actually get deeper in to some of these places that we've been able to get into in the past. So um, this year we had 50 total points. Each of them was visited twice with the protocol, and we did it all within three hours of dawn. Uh, so you have, you're supposed to do it actually closer to two hours. Mostly we're you know, within two hours of dawn to get out um, there. And I should say, I don't do the actual field work. Um, Chris Lumber, other name on here, um, does the, the morning point counts, uh, gets in his kayak, gets at the waiting at the gate at dawn, and goes in and um, does this visits a set of points in a given morning, however many he can get to um, within the, that time period close to dawn. We are looking for um, uh, eight species at this point. And I am going to go th through them with the results, but I realized for this audience, I probably should have had just pictured the birds and explained what they do a little bit more. Um, but uh, Pipeville Grebe, Common Gallinule, American Coot, King Rail, Virginia Rail, Sora Rail, American Bittern, and Least Bittern. We, in 2011, we had also included Black Rail, but it's really not. It's, it's on the, we're on the very, very edge, outsider edge of this range, so we're not really in a prime area for it. It just added a lot of extra time to the whole protocol every time, every point to include it. So this, we've been excluding it for the last three years. So these are the points we visit. Uh, and I'll just talk about some of the results. American coot, this is one where we get lots and lots of the species during migration and into the winter. Um, but it's not one that we've had breeding here in any numbers recently, and it is considered to be, uh, it's rare for Pennsylvania to have it breeding here. Uh, we had, in, way back in 2011, we had records of it in, during the breeding season here. Um, we have not had records of it since then until this year. We actually had one in June, late June, in um, an area close to uh, <coughs> between Big Pond and Wall Pond. I can't remember the names of them. Along the pontoon boat trail there in the central <coughs> area. So um, that was an exciting occurrence this year. So that's the update on the coots. Um, Pineville Creek, similar thing. We don't get that many of them um, here. We are somewhat on the edge of their breeding range, but we historically, they should be here. And we had them, again, at the head of the area, we call the head of the bay, the neck of the bay, whatever your term is for it. Had them here back in 2011. Last year, or 2017, I guess, we had one at Leo's. 
um, during the breeding season and responding to playbacks. This year we had two, um, one at the head of the bay and then one way out here, Niagara Pond. Um, so that was an interesting occurrence this year. We had two different ones um, at different locations again in late June during the rating season. Virginia Rail is another one. It's the smallest, it's probably the smallest one we have. Uh, well, not so true. I think the stores are small. Um, but um, we've had them somewhat sporadically. Uh, we had them um, 2011, they were at, uh, we have one anyway at uh, Leo's Landing. Uh, and then 2018, we had a couple of them. Uh, this year we actually had, this is sort of zoomed in a little bit on the, we did not have them at Leo's or the head of the bay, but we had a whole bunch of them right in here, um, like five all calling at the same time, really little population of them there, uh, plus some other sightings in other locations um, during the surveys. So that was exciting to get more of them this year. Sora was one where uh, it has been, again, sporadic. Uh, it is the smaller one. We've had it in different locations over, over the years. And it, this is one we did not detect this year at all. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, we did not pick it up. Conley Gallinol uh, is the um, second, um, second most common of the species we have of the set of eight. Um, and it has been reasonably widespread in the previous years. Um, although, again, oops, absent so oops, absent from the main all the main marshes for uh, in the 2011 era, coming back uh, in the 1718. Um, and then again, we had a, probably four an estimated four individuals in 2019. Uh, so that was actually a slightly lower number than previous year. This is our most common, most abundant one, uh, the least better. Um, we have had quite a large number, I would say, <laughs> through the years here, um, which is a good thing because it is a very rare bird elsewhere uh, in the state. And uh, we had Every year we try to estimate the number of individuals based on the location of the, of the survey points and repeatedly seeing one, a bird in a certain place, we assume it's going to be the same individual. So we try to go through and estimate um, how many unique individuals we think there are. We could be off by a couple uh, in this case. But 2018, uh, we had, last year we, uh, we had um, 26 individuals. In 2017, that was a year where we did a lot of pre-herbicide monitoring. So the Game Commission had required extra monitoring in addition to, so it was, I don't know, it was like a fluky year. So we actually had, did a lot of surveys that were not during the standard protocol. And during that other, uh, the pre-herbicide survey work, we actually picked up quite a few, 23 additional sightings of the species. Um, that did not occur during the time interval protocol. So they were extra, uh, which is why that number is so high. Uh, but these are the locations, uh, distribution of those sightings in the previous year. <coughs> this year, um, we had an estimated 21 individuals. So again, this one dropped slightly. Um, and these are, but again, this is all the locations, many of the same locations where we've been seeing them in previous years. We did find one nest this year, actually. Chris um, found a nest that had three eggs, and he went back to check it a couple times, but uh, tried to stay away from it. <laughs> and we didn't tell anybody where it was either. Uh, we didn't want anybody harassing it. Um, so we did have a nest, and we, it did have chicks in it. And one of the subsequent checks uh, were not. We assume all three made it, but we don't really know. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the distribution of the, um, the birds this year. Um, so this is a combined, all of the species uh, for just this year that we found. There were no sauras, 
And I will say, although we keep surveying for American bitter and for um, king rail, we have yet to detect those two species at this site. Those are both species that require large areas, um, the kind of area sensitive larger birds that need extensive emergent marsh habitat. And um, although I think we do have it and have the potential to have it here, um, we don't have those birds here this time. And we um, keep hoping that this restoration work will ultimately create the, the right habitat for them, um, but it hasn't quite yet. So this is the location for this year. And one thing's really odd to me is that we've never got anybody, uh, any of our target species at Leo's Landing this year for some reason. Um, so it's, uh, check my time. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why that, that is. Um, so this is the, all the sites we were surveying this year, superimposed on locations where all the birds were detected. Um, so that's, this, the, 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 the red circles are the, about a 100 meter diameter. We feel we can detect, pretty good at detecting within the 100 meters of the uh, point where we're doing the broadcast and the, the listening. Uh, so this is the thing. But all those points we checked out at Gull Point this year, we did get two least bitters out there. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see now that that area has been treated for the Phragmites. Um, I am hoping to get um, to see what happens over the next few years, whether additional species come back in. Um, so that'll be neat to see. Um, but um, should we move along. Oh yeah, here's the summary table. So this is just comparing numbers through the years, 2011, 2017, 18, 19. Um, least bitter has been our most numerous one. And it's, I, I don't know whether, this is during the surveys, this is, the, the first number is frequency. Out of the number of points we surveyed, how many points had the species present? And then the number of parentheses is the number of estimated individuals detected. Um, so I don't know how, whether this is this sort of the number of species of individuals seems to go down, or we had a high point in 17 and it's been decreasing. Uh, I don't know that that's going to be significant statistically. Um, and again, that was the year that we did a lot of, out, of survey work outside of the survey the time surveys. Um, so this other species here, Congalino, uh, again, there's a, maybe a slight decrease over the last three years. Uh, it's hard to know whether that's a significant trend or not. Um, and then everything else is kind of spotty, basically, uh, whether it's here or not. So I think that's all on the marsh birds. These better Congalino have and maybe a slight decrease, although again, I don't know that it's really statistical. Um, there's still no American bitters or king rails yet. Uh, Coot and high bill green both present this year, which was nice. Um, no marsh, marsh birds were detected at Leo's Landing this year, and I don't have no good explanation for that. Other than, I will say, the water level issue for the birds. Um, I think the ink, they, these are birds that build their nests in emergent marshes, they, they do put them a little bit above water level. Uh, some of them are attached to stems, others are more like on mounds of vegetation. They can be susceptible to these water level rises and um, they could lose nests. Uh, I still think we should have detected them if they had established territories there, um, but it is tough for these birds, I think. Leo's is one of the more exposed areas exposed to more high fluctuations up and down of the water levels um, if due to storm effects and wind effects and so on. Whereas the interior lagoons have a more delayed response. I think they don't go up and down as fast um, and that might be protecting the birds in the interior to some extent, although the water levels still go up and down. And I'd really like us to start measuring the water levels in those interior lagoons. Um, because I do think it affects the nest success of the birds. Um, anyway, so this is my picture of Hudson's pool, as I call it. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, adjacent to the road out there. And I think that this diversity 
And uh, the, the, the breaking up of the monolithic big stands of the tall reed um, is really going to ultimately be very productive for the birds. Um, we have yet to really pick up anybody coming in here, though. But this is kind of a shallow water site without these bird aquatics. And so it's an interesting site, but we'll see what happens over the years. I wanted to briefly now just say a couple of words about water bird monitoring. And um, this is um, new with this round of, uh, of this funding. So we only started this this year in the spring, early spring. We're now monitoring um, water bird uh, birds, which is uh, ducks, geese, plus loons, and grebes, coots, uh, you know, a few other sort of allied species. So it's not, um, it's a little bit broader than just ducks. So I don't say waterfowl. We have 16 locations for the park where we do visual counts. Um, and actually new this fall, we're trying to get duck hunters to cooperate with us. We have a new data form for them to fill out um, and drop off for us. Um, so this is, we're trying to get hunter cooperation and because we figure they're, they're out there looking at, for hours on end and they're blind, looking at what's in front of them. We would like to have them contribute counts. So if you know any duck hunters, uh, encourage them to participate in our, our uh, monitoring work. Um, I don't have any of the results here, but we did duck use day calculations for spring for the 16 locations we monitored. And um, we'll be, I'm gonna try to remember to include that in my presentation for next year, um, and not just focus on the market. But I think I'm out of time, so I should um, to go. Whoops, I have no idea what that is. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's it. Uh, any questions?